This is a case of America's largest corporate bankruptcy. At first, they seemed like just another boring energy company. But in February of 2001, a dark secret was revealed. A secret that destroyed countless lives and caused unimaginable pain and suffering that still affects all of us. I thought I already knew everything about Enron, but in my research, I fell into a rabbit hole darker than I could have ever imagined. Because no matter how successful they were, there was one simple question they refused to answer. How does Enron really make money? This is the dark and disturbing story of Enron, the most evil fraud in history, and it all starts with a lonely kid. Breaking news alert is about former Enron CEO Jeffrey Skilling. The mastermind of it all, former CEO Jeff Skilling. Looking at the lonely and misunderstood nerdy kid in high school, you could have never imagined that he would grow up to become the evil genius of Enron. From a very young age, Jeffrey Skilling had started to compare himself to the other kids and realized that they had much better toys than he did. But he felt bad about asking his parents for anything because he understood that they were working really hard just to afford the food on their table. Jeffrey was always incredibly smart and easily got the best grades in high school, but he thought it was so boring. And being the nerdy kid that he was, he had a difficult time finding friends in a school where all the cool kids played football. This was a perfect recipe for Jeffrey to escape into work. And soon the 14 year old was working 50 hour weeks at a local TV station, where he started off cleaning and painting the walls. But but when the production director quit, he had learned enough about all the equipment to take his place and become the new director. But sadly, Jeffrey was also a bit of a gambler, and despite having made $15,000 by the time he started college, he risked it all in the stock market. He had even doubled his money to $30,000, but refused to take any profits until he lost it all. But the stock market had introduced him to the world of business and finance, and in his last year at college, Jeffrey switched from engineering to business courses and ended the year with a perfect 4.0 GPA. The fascination with the stock market and Charles Darwin's theory of evolution started to change the young Jeffrey's life philosophy. He was now convinced that only the strongest would survive in this world and that the only driving force of any human was greed or money. In fact, money soon became the only thing that mattered for Jeffrey and he was willing to do anything to get it. After after working a couple years at a bank after his college graduation, Jeffrey still felt like it wasn't nearly enough, and so he applied to Harvard Business School, miraculously got in, and again graduated at the top of his class, and got a job as a management consultant at one of the most prestigious consulting firms in the world, McKinsey & Company. There he would work to develop new theories and strategies that would help companies grow and make more money. But the culture of McKinsey rewards individual achievements achievement, and Jeffrey soon learned to humiliate and put down anyone who dared to disagree with him to make himself look better. And so, with extreme speed, Jeffrey climbed the ranks at McKinsey, soon making over a million dollars a year. Of course, he had no idea what was coming next. Jeffrey was about to receive a call that would lead him down an incredibly dark path. Jeffrey Skilling was just going about his day when suddenly his phone rang. But this time he couldn't believe who was calling and what he was asking him to do. Jeffrey's heart was racing. On the other end of the line was Richard Kinder, who was a top executive from a company called Enron, which mainly worked to find, produce, store, and transport natural gas to different customers, ultimately providing energy that reaches different companies and homes across the United States. And the CEO of Enron, Ken Lay, had a pretty incredible story himself because he grew up poor and barely had access to running water, but still managed to fight his way to the top and become CEO of Houston Natural Gas, which soon after merged with Inter North from Nebraska to create Enron, where Ken became the CEO a year later. Ken had big dreams for Enron and he wanted to change how the natural gas market worked so that anyone could buy gas from whoever they wanted without any restrictions. And he made this deregulation happen 
Biden by using his political connections and even donating money to important people like the Bush family. But now Ken knew he needed help to make the most of this change because the energy industry was very complicated and he needed some really smart people to think of new ways to do things. And so he turned to McKinsey Services and found Jeffrey Skilling who knew a lot about energy and who quickly came up with a genius plan. Back in the 1980s, buying and selling natural gas was slow and confusing. It took forever to make a single deal and the prices changed so much that no one knew if they were getting a good deal or not. Jeffrey's plan was for Enron to become the middleman for gas producers and the people who needed the gas. Enron would create long-term contracts so both sides knew exactly what they were getting and how much they were paying. It sounded like a win-win for everyone and of course Enron would get paid for these types of services and as the middleman they could always find the very best deals for themselves making sure to sell the gas for a higher price than they bought it for. Jeffrey called this idea the Enron gas bank. He thought it was absolutely genius and it was time for him to present it to Enron. So one day in 1987 a nervous but excited Jeffrey Skilling walked into a conference room on the 49th floor of Enron's headquarters in Houston. In there sat 25 of Enron's top executives, including Ken Lay and Richard Kinder. In less than 30 minutes, Jeffrey was done with the explanation of the Enron gas bank. But after a short moment of complete silence, one of the executives looked at Jeffrey and told him that this idea seemed really dumb. And soon pretty much everyone else in the room agreed. And just like that, the meeting ended. Jeffrey was in shock and he ran up to Richard Kinder and apologized for his bad explanation of the idea. But Richard was actually happy and he thought that the reaction of the Enron executives was a perfect sign that Jeffrey's idea was revolutionary because it showed how scared they were of losing their jobs. And so with the help of Jeffrey as a consultant, Enron decided to create the Enron gas bank. But it was all a disaster. Nothing was going as expected. It was easy to convince natural gas buyers to use Enron services. And they actually wanted to pay a lot of money just to be guaranteed a steady supply of gas. But the actual producers of natural gas refused to sell anything to Enron. Natural gas was really cheap at the time. And it made no sense for the producers to get stuck in a 5 to 10 year contract today if they thought that the price would be much higher tomorrow. Jeffrey himself had noticed this and he wanted to jump in and show Enron how it is supposed to be done. But there was just one problem. Jeffrey didn't even work for Enron. He was only a consultant from McKinsey and his only job was to give advice to help them succeed. But despite this, Jeffrey was starting to fall in love with Enron. He had so many more ideas for the Enron gas bank and the culture of the company was just perfect for him. Even even better than McKinsey. As we know, Jeffrey liked to work with people who only cared about making money and who had no problem doing some unethical things to get there. As long as they didn't get caught, of course. Well, it turns out that's exactly what Enron was doing at the time. For example, around 1987, there was a wild rumor going around with people whispering about Enron's oil trading unit, which was making a lot of money. They seemed really good but almost too good. So people started wondering if something suspicious was going on behind the scenes. And it turns out that they were right because these guys weren't just trading the market, they were like gamblers in a casino, making really high risk bets with many of them going terribly wrong. But instead of owning up to their mistakes, they chose to hide them through fake accounts and false documents. With $2 million magically going directly to the personal bank account of one of the top executives in the trading unit. This was of course highly illegal and you would think any regular executive would put a stop to 
into it, but not Kenneth Lay. When he noticed, he simply told these traders to please keep making us millions. And when they finally got caught and convicted of fraud, with one of them even going to jail, Ken said that he had no idea what they were doing. But these things only made Jeffrey even more attracted to Enron. It perfectly fit his life philosophy, where only the strongest would survive, that there were no rules or ethics when making money. But Jeffrey also liked the fast-paced environment and a feeling that they were so close to achieving something very big. He genuinely wanted to revolutionize an industry that had been so boring for so long. And of course, Enron wanted Jeffrey just as much. And so the time had come, the moment where Richard Kinder, on behalf of Enron, decided to call up Jeffrey and offer him a 70% pay cut to join the company full time and take control of the Enron gas bank. But it was a ridiculous offer. He would go from making a million dollars a year to making 275,000. But he would also own a small percentage of the Enron gas bank, which meant that he would be insanely wealthy if it succeeded. Jeffrey's colleagues at McKinsey would have never dreamed of giving up their high status position for less than a third of their previous salary. But Jeffrey could only imagine himself one day being called the king of the energy industry, celebrated and admired by everyone and practically swimming in money. But Jeffrey had one last request before joining Enron. He would only join the company if they agreed to one major condition. A condition that would send shockwaves through the industry and lead to the suffering of millions of people. And which would be talked about for decades to come. But we'll get to that later. It was difficult for both Enron and the government, but they finally accepted Jeffrey's request. There was no turning back now. Jeffrey had made the decision and he was about to go to war. But little did he know, the entire world would soon come to wish that he had stayed at McKenzie. It is the early 1990s and Jeffrey is working his magic on Enron's gas service department. But there's a problem. He needs to make energy contracts more attractive so that gas producers actually want to sell to customers, something Enron had struggled with before. So how does Jeffrey solve this? With a genius but simple idea of hedging, which is like an insurance. Imagine you're an Apple farmer, worried about falling prices. So you set a hedging contract with a buyer who agrees to a fixed price priced for your apples. Now, no matter how markets go, how the prices swing, you will be guarded from potential losses, which makes everyone, Enron included, feel more safe in their trading. This strategy was very successful, and Jeffrey had already started to attract the attention of the Wall Street banks. But he went even further and started to trade electricity as well, which was now also starting to get deregulated, partly thanks to Enron's lobbying activities. This idea would later turn out disastrous, but in the early 1990s it was a huge success and the world was shocked at the genius of Jeffrey and his team. But Jeffrey wanted so much more. He wanted to go beyond the borders of the United States. Countries around the world were starting to open up their energy sectors, so Jeffrey helped influence Enron to take this opportunity of a lifetime to become a more global company. One of the craziest projects Enron started was the double power plant project in India in the mid 90s. It was one of the largest foreign investments in India's history and Enron had promised the Indian government that it would help meet the growing energy demand of the country. But it wasn't just India. Deals were being made left, right and center with countries like the UK, Brazil and Argentina slowly building Enron's global energy empire. During this time, Enron was doing incredibly well, but despite being a massive company doing a lot of different things, the trading department that Jeffrey had created was the biggest reason for their crazy growth. Already in 1992, Jeffrey's ECT was the second largest source of income for the company, and by the end of the year, Jeffrey cashed in a $4.7 million paycheck from Enron by selling a small part of his own stake in the ECT. This meant that in just two short 
short years, Jeffrey had built something that was valued at $650 million. The corporate world now had all their eyes on Jeffrey. Ken and the other top figures of Enron were showering him with compliments. And by the mid 1990s, he wasn't just a corporate sensation. Jeffrey had become a Wall Street celebrity and his schedule was quickly filling up with conferences, industry events and press meetings because everyone wanted to know the secret behind Jeffrey's success and hear his thoughts on the energy sector's future. Jeffrey's employees also loved him, admiring his energy and passion for Enron, but also his ability to recruit and help new people become top leaders in the company. Jeffrey was often at different company events and parties, talking and connecting with employees from all different levels, where he inspired and motivated everyone. This type of attention was something the lonely and isolated teenage Jeffrey could have only dreamed of. He had finally shown the world what he could do and he was making millions and millions of dollars doing it. But behind closed doors, Jeffrey's love for his work was slowly turning into an obsession. The excitement of trading, the adrenaline rush of closing a deal, and the intellectual challenge of gaming the system all started to keep him up at night. Because maybe Jeffrey had gone too far, maybe he had sacrificed too much to get here. Jeffrey had always loved working, but he loved it so much that he was even working on his employment contracts while his wife, Susan, was giving birth to their third child. They had been married since 1975 and had three children together, but the reality was that Jeffrey was almost never at home. And now, two decades into their marriage, Susan, who had once been Jeffrey's biggest supporter, had now reached a breaking point. The man she had married seemed more distant than ever and barely spent time with his children. So Susan was thinking of divorcing him. And if that wasn't enough, Jeffrey's health was quickly going downhill. His crazy work schedule, zero exercise, and a diet of Cheetos, Twinkies, and Diet Coke were all catching up to him. And one day, Jeffrey got a sharp pain in his chest that was so intense that he thought he was about to die. Jeffrey's body was breaking down, his family was slipping away, and he was feeling more alone than ever. He was already really rich. He could slow down and focus on saving his relationship relationships with his wife and children. Or he could push forward at full speed and sacrifice everything to take Enron to new unimaginable heights. Jeffrey's choice would change the world forever. It is 1996 and Jeffrey had given up. He had started to work part-time and focus on his relationships, but it was all for nothing. His wife Susan had walked out the door and when Jeffrey looked around, he realized that his friends were basically just his co-workers and that his real home was actually Enron. Little by little, Jeffrey's obsession with the number in his bank account and the thought of taking over the energy industry returned. Jeffrey was ready for round two, but but only this time, he would be even more ruthless, willing to destroy anyone standing in the way of his goal of money and power. And lucky for him, Richard Kinder was about to quit his job as the chief operating officer at Enron, which meant that the seat was going to be empty. And this was Jeffrey's chance to take control. The clock was ticking, and Jeffrey knew he had to act quickly. He first tracked down the CEO, Ken Lay, and told him that if anyone else was given this job, Jeffrey would quit right on the spot. This was a smart move because Jeffrey knew how much the company needed him. He then warned that if Jeffrey's main rival, Rebecca Mark, was chosen, it would lead to a full-blown revolution within the company and Enron would implode. Jeffrey then gathered his trusted and loyal inner circle friends at the ECT, which he had full control over. And he made sure that they would also go crazy if anyone else but Jeffrey became the new COO. And now, Ken had no choice. The trading unit was the heart of of the company. And if Jeffrey quit, everyone would hate Ken for it. So with these genius tactics, it only took two weeks after the previous COO quit for Ken Lay to announce that the new president and CEO of Enron would be none other than Jeffrey Skilling. Jeffrey had never had this much power, and this time he had nothing to lose. 
He started off by rewarding his loyal friends and making life miserable for his enemies at Enron. He then went to work to create an organization that completely reflected his Darwinian beliefs, where the smartest and most money-hungry individuals could have maximum freedom and resources to do whatever they want with Enron. Performance was the only thing Jeffrey cared about, so he looked for people with unique talents, regardless of their flaws or social standings. Egomaniac, social outcast, and backstabbers were all welcome in Jeffrey's world. He believed that it was better for his employees to not get along because it created a tension that would lead to the best ideas winning. Jeffrey wanted his employees to tear each other down for the ultimate prize. And to make this happen, he even created a ranking system where twice a year employees would be ranked from 1 to 5 based on their performance, which often in reality meant employees who had many connections and who were bringing in money for the company. But the crazy part is that this ranking system was based on a curve, so employees would be compared to each other and there would always be a bottom 10% who would get fired from the company and a top 10% would be rewarded with massive bonuses. This made it so that employees really cared about looking good and putting everyone else down and it attracted even more ruthless outcasts to Enron. Jeffrey's right hand man was the perfect example of this. Hired by him, Lou Pai had helped him build the Enron trading department and later became a big part of Enron itself. But he was a man that would eat you alive if it would help him. Being a married, middle-aged father of two, Pai also had a secret relationship with an exotic dancer, which everyone at the office knew about. But as soon as Pai proved himself on the trading floor, Jeffrey started to really like him and gave him complete freedom to run the entire operation. Another example was a rising star, Andrew Fastow, who despite barely having any accounting knowledge, was promoted with the help of Jeffrey to chief financial officer of Enron. Jeffrey was very impressed with Andrew's ability to create complicated and hard to understand financial structures, allowing Enron to raise tens of billions of dollars for their projects and then present their numbers in a way that always made Enron look good. But like many others at Enron, Andrew also only cared about himself. He had a crazy temper and everyone was afraid of him, too afraid to ever speak out if they disagreed. As a CFO, he was never supposed to be able to do whatever he wanted without any oversight. But he was too much of a bully for anyone to keep him in check. And soon, Andrew started doing shadier and shadier things. And just like that, Jeffrey had packed Enron full of people like Lou Pai and Andrew Fasto. Ambitious and smart, but also greedy and willing to do anything to make more money. And it showed. Enron's top executives now had all-time access to a bunch of corporate jets and limousines. And as soon as the top performers received bonuses, the car dealerships would be swarmed with Enron employees trying to buy new Porsches. Jeffrey himself started to build a giant 8,000 square foot villa in River Oaks. And he had even found a new lover who he gave massive massive bonuses to simply because of the relationship. But despite these crazy things, Wall Street and the corporate world could only admire Jeffrey and Enron's incredible achievements. Enron was among the largest energy companies in the US. The stock price was at the highest it has ever been, worth $70 billion and the seventh largest public company in the US. And by the year 2000, they had a revenue of more than $100 billion, which was even more impressive considering they only had around 20,000 employees at the time. It really was Enron against the world, and their offices were filled with Harvard Business School professors who tried their best to understand the secret behind their success. Multiple management books had been published about the insane domination of Enron, and Fortune magazine had named them the most innovative company six years in a row and one of the best places to work at in the US. Even McKinsey, the consulting firm where Jeffrey once worked, started to call Enron employees petropreneurs, a combination of petroleum and entrepreneur. They were just amazed by Enron's ability to disrupt and revolutionize the traditional gas industry. And as the mastermind behind it all, a lot of the credit went straight to Jeffrey himself. It seemed like Jeffrey's decision to dedicate his life to Enron had worked out. 
Although he had sacrificed everything else, at least he would go down in history as a business icon who made more money than anyone could have dreamed of. Or so he thought. It was time for his entire world to be turned upside down, as the dark secrets of Enron were only growing stronger and the uncomfortable truth could no longer be ignored. As Enron kept skyrocketing in value, Jeffrey had to distract everyone from an uncomfortable truth. Enron was no longer a natural gas or pipeline company. It had transformed into something completely different. A full-blown trading company, making its money simply through buying assets at a lower price and selling them at a higher price. Jeffrey had promised investors massive double-digit growth, but the reality was that such growth was pretty much impossible for this kind of company, which didn't really make or build anything of value. Up until now, investors hadn't noticed this problem, and everything seemed so perfect at Enron. But how could this even be possible? The answer lies in a series of advanced tactics used by Jeffrey and Enron to make the company look perfect. Each tactic crazier than the other, with the third one being the craziest and the big condition Jeffrey requested before joining Enron. Now firstly, we all know that a massive public company like Enron is supposed to be closely looked at by auditors, which are basically like financial detectives. Their job is to look through a company's books to make sure that nothing illegal legal is going on. Well, in the case of Enron, their auditors were a company named Arthur Anderson, or Anderson for short. But Jeffrey and other top executives had close relationships with Anderson, and what's even worse is that Anderson were also their consultants, providing things like tax, IT, and risk management services. Enron even started to hire people from Anderson, with the chief accounting officer of the company, Richard Causey, previously being a managing director at Anderson, who specifically was auditing Enron. This created a situation where Anderson, which should have been the financial detective of Enron, thanks to their close relationships, instead helped them to hide everything illegal and unethical that was going on, which in turn led to Enron hiring more and more of Anderson's consulting services. It was a win-win for them both, but of course a disaster for everyone else. But it gets even worse. Secondly, with Enron's financial detectives instead being their helpers, it means that Andrew Fastow, the chief financial officer of Enron, can now be even more shady with his strategies. Which takes us to Andrew's secret fund. Because sometimes Enron, just like any other company, makes bad investments that don't work out and lose them money. But for those cases, Andrew created small companies within Enron known as special purpose entities, which he would use to buy these investments from Enron, almost like a fund. That way, Enron was buying things from itself, but it looked like they could never lose money because all the bad investments would instead be hidden under all these mini companies that Andrew had created. And not just that, this fund had a management fee, which meant that millions of dollars went directly into Andrew's pocket, simply by buying assets from himself. And because it was all so complicated, no one could understand what was even going on yet. And now, thirdly, the super glue that was holding this massive fraud together. The one genius thing Jeffrey wanted before joining Enron was a special form of accounting method known as mark-to-market accounting, which is a way companies can calculate the total value of a deal they have made. Let's say that Enron builds a power plant for $100 million, thinking that when it is completed, they will profit $200 million over the next 10 years. Years. Using mark-to-market accounting, Enron can now instantly claim those $200 million as their income for this year, even though they haven't sold any electricity at all yet. It might sound insane, but this method is actually pretty common. But in the case of Enron, no one had done these kinds of contracts with gas or electricity before. So Jeffrey, 
started to make more and more optimistic forecasts for different projects, always thinking that the price of energy would be going up a lot and that every single project would pretty much go perfectly as planned. And slowly these forecasts would go from optimistic to aggressive to simply illegal. And whenever some project didn't go as planned, Enron barely changed their estimations or Andrew Fasta would step in with his mini companies to buy up that investment. Maybe you remember the Indian double project I mentioned earlier. Well, it was a catastrophic failure. Everything went wrong. Massive delays and fights with the government forced Enron to give up the project with a total loss of $5 billion. But the huge profits Enron had estimated using mark-to-market -market accounting barely changed until it was too late. A similar thing happened with one of Jeffrey's biggest ideas for Enron, the Enron Broadband Services. He wanted Enron to deliver high-speed internet services and create a trading platform for bandwidth, similar to what he had done for natural gas and electricity. Jeffrey had hyped this idea up a lot by announcing an insane 20-year deal with the company Blockbuster, where he actually wanted to create something similar to what Netflix is today, where people watch movies over the internet. So this wasn't actually a bad idea, but it was way too early for its time, since in the late 1990s the internet was still so small and the network Enron had designed was very expensive and had a bunch of technical issues. After all, they had no real experience in the telecom industry. Still, Jeffrey made sure to write down huge estimations for how much money the Enron broadband services would make. And when it started to fail, they never readjusted these estimations, despite billions of dollars in losses. All these strategies combined with the greedy and selfish work culture that Jeffrey had created meant that no one really cared about stopping these crimes. Instead, Jeffrey's inner circle had no problem doing even worse things as long as they got a piece of the pie themselves. And of course, in Jeffrey's eyes, everything was fine. He knew about these illegal activities, but things had gone too far for him to take a step back now. And without his family, he didn't really have much to go back home to anyways. Also, after all, it was the government's responsibility to keep an eye on him and Jeffrey just loved outsmarting the system like he had done his entire life. So now you might think that sure, although all of this sounds horrible, it is still just accounting fraud and it may be difficult to see how it affects everyday people like you and me, but all of that was about to change and it was time for Jeffrey and Enron to cross the final line. So far, they had gotten away with it. But now, Enron was about to steal money from everyday people, leading to death and suffering. And this time, things would end differently. Unfortunately, it looks like uh, the blackouts are likely to continue throughout the day and into this evening. The year is 2000, and the state of California was in the peak of a historical energy crisis, but no one knew it was caused by Enron. The year before had already been a disaster, with almost 100,000 people in San Francisco experiencing a total blackout in the middle of a brutal heat wave. The number grew in early 2001 to hundreds of thousands, and finally to one and a half million people experiencing blackouts in entire California. The the governor had declared a state of emergency. The blackouts had led to traffic lights going out, causing car accidents and traffic jams. Businesses had to close down and more than a million households had no lights and no cooling. The lack of electricity affected hospitals which could no longer properly treat their patients. The consequences were horrifying, with thousands of people dying, unemployment going up and in total costing California's economy $45 billion. It was hard to imagine Imagine that in the heart of this crisis was Jeffrey, Ken and Enron, who had made more than a billion dollars off of the suffering of the Californians. With Kenneth Lay even saying, quote, no matter what the crazy people in California did, he had people working for him at Enron that could figure out the way to make money. The evil plan of Enron had started with using their political connections to help deregulate the energy market of California, so they can freely start buying and selling 
electricity as a part of their trading operations. When they finally succeeded with that, everything was in place to make some real money. Enron knew that the price of electricity is driven by supply and demand. So the higher the demand and the lower the supply, the more expensive electricity will become, of course. So Enron traders used a number of manipulation tactics to drive up the price of electricity. One of the main strategies was called ricochet, where Enron would buy electricity in California, export it to another state, and then sell it back to California at much higher prices, which forced California to buy from Enron to avoid a power shortage. This worked really well because California had a limit on how expensive its power could be in order to protect customers. But this limit didn't exist when it was time for California to import electricity from other states. Another one of Enron's tactics was even more straightforward and involved simply shutting down their own power plants whenever California needs power the most, using the excuse that they are doing it for maintenance, which led to a lower supply and which forced California to buy electricity at much higher prices, filling Enron's pockets in the process. And the most disturbing part of it all is that this was no simple mistake or misunderstanding. Enron knew exactly what they were doing the entire time, and they even laughed about all the people they were hurting. And as if Ken Lay's comments aren't enough, a disturbing recording was later found of a phone call between two Enron traders. What money you got stole from those poor grandmothers of California? <laughs> yeah, Grandma Millie, man. But she's the one who couldn't figure out how to f***ing vote on the butterfly ballot. But yeah, now she wants her f***ing money back for all the power you've charged right up, jammed right up her ass for f***ing $250 a megawatt hour. <laughs> <laughs> but although this is horrifying, at the same time the year 2000 had come to an end. And surprisingly, Enron was still in a good shape, valued at over 60 billion dollars, with the stock price still being close to its peak, almost double the price from last year. It seemed like Jeffrey's charm and charisma worked really well to convince all the reporters that Enron was actually doing their best to help out California during this crisis, where he even said said that we are on the side of the angels. It really seemed like Enron had gotten away with it, but now they had gotten the attention of some very important people. And little did Jeffrey know, Enron only had less than 12 months left to live. And it all started with what seemed like a very innocent phone call on February of 2001. It was time for the beginning of the end. On February 14th, 2001, Jeffrey Skilling picked up the phone and he had no idea that this was going to be the second call that would change his life forever. This time it was Bethany McLean on the other line, a young writer for the famous business magazine Fortune. She had been approached by a group of analysts who had looked into Enron's financials and discovered something strange. They found that Enron was barely making any money from their pipeline and natural natural gas operations. And they claimed that Enron had instead turned into a speculative trading firm, almost gambling its money. They had also noticed that Enron added $3.9 billion in debt in just nine months, which made no sense if they were as profitable as they claimed. Now Bethany was a bit skeptical. Her own magazine Fortune loved saying good things about Enron and so did everyone else. And she also knew that these analysts were short sellers, meaning they wanted to make money by betting on the downfall of Enron. But Bethany was also a bit confused reading Enron's reports, so she decided to call the man in charge, Jeffrey Skilling, thinking she would get some clarity. But Jeffrey was tired and frustrated. He had only been CEO for two weeks and he had been very busy and he hated to defend Enron against all these people he thought of as jealous haters trying to take him down. Jeffrey kept telling Bethany that Enron was a logistics company, with its core business being transporting natural gas and electricity. But Bethany just wasn't happy with those answers, and she kept digging until Jeffrey finally hung up the phone after telling Bethany that she should do her research better. Realizing how bad this looked, the head of PR of Enron called Bethany quickly afterwards and asked if she wanted to come to New York tomorrow and 
meet up with him and the head of investor relations, as well as the infamous CFO Andrew Fasta, where they promised to answer all her questions. So the day after, in a small conference room in New York, Bethany McLean, two Fortune editors and the three top Enron executives started their interview. Once again, Bethany asked about the business model of Enron, but again things seemed a little strange. Andrew first gave her an explanation where he compared Enron to Toyota, saying that similar to Toyota, Enron is an assembler rather than a manufacturer. Then Andrew also said that they don't really want to tell anyone where they're making money. Bethany also asked Andrew about the buying that was going on from the mini companies within Enron. Andrew said that it is a way to reduce Enron's risk. What Bethany didn't know is that she was directly asking about Andrew's own fund, which he was making millions of dollars with illegally. Then after the two hour meeting, the other executives left the room, but Andrew stayed and simply told Bethany I don't care what you say about the company, just don't make me look bad. But it was too late, and a deadly storm was coming. Just a week later, Enron employees picked up the latest edition of Fortune magazine, hoping for another great article. But their hopes were crushed when they saw the cover that simply read, Is Enron Overpriced? For decades, Enron had been the darling of Wall Street, but this article, which wasn't even that bad, had planted just a small seed of doubt in the minds of investors, leading to a 10% drop in the stock price on the very same day. The once invincible empire of Jeffrey had started to crack, and he knew he had to act fast or things would only get worse. So as Jeffrey stood at the analyst conference in April 2001, he proudly presented another quarter of record growth for Enron. He then opened up to answer the questions of different investors in the meeting. Only this time he would receive a question that would finally break him. Jeffrey had poured his heart and soul into Enron. It was almost like his child, so when another famous short seller got a chance to ask his question, Jeffrey could no longer keep it together. You're the only financial institution that can't produce a balance sheet or a cash flow statement with their earnings. <laughs> well, you, 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 well uh, thank you very much. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. <laughs> The audience couldn't believe their own ears. Jeffrey had just attacked one of the analysts in front of everyone. A CEO should be able to handle the hardest and most aggressive questions with no problem. But the once cool and confident Jeffrey could no longer keep up his fake smile. Jeffrey's mask was about to slip and investors didn't really believe what he had to say anymore. This in combination with the 2001 stock market crash being in full swing led to Enron stock collapsing along with everything else. Jeffrey found himself more and more isolated, missing the days when he had been excited to create an entirely new industry. All his old friends at the company had started to leave, and it really was lonely at the top. He started spending more and more time at bars, drinking and smoking, but nothing could numb the pain of knowing that all he had worked so hard for was about to collapse. He had sacrificed everything, missed out on watching his children grow up, lost his wife, and he had nothing to show for it. And so, on on August 13th of 2001, with tears in his eyes, Jeffrey looked at Ken Lay and Enron's board members and announced that he was quitting, telling them how much he loved Enron but that he felt guilty for not being there for his children. When these news came out, things got even worse for Enron, with the stock going all the way down to $40 a share, less than half of the all-time high. Now at this point, maybe you think that Jeffrey couldn't go any lower. But the time had come for Jeffrey and Ken Lay to not only betray and scam the outside world, but to also betray their own employees. Just two months before his resignation, Jeffrey sold Enron stock for $15.5 million. And a week after Jeffrey quit, Ken started to sell Enron shares for millions of dollars. All this while at the same time sending out emails to Enron's employees, telling them that they should buy more Enron's stock because he thinks the price will go up. And many of these employees even had their entire retirement savings invested in Enron, all because Jeffrey and Ken had told them so. Did we invest all of our 401k in Enron stock? Absolutely. Don't you guys agree? <laughs> 
And so, while the Enron ship was sinking, ending in a bankruptcy in December of 2001, Ken, Jeffrey and Andrew thought they had gotten away with tens of millions of dollars in their pockets. At the same time, tens of thousands had lost their jobs, with many of them losing their entire life savings. I have a wife and two kids and, and uh, that's always a concern, you know, where, where we're going to what we're gonna do. This was supposed to be a very solid company. No worries about your future, right? If you come from a small dot-com startup, you go to Enron to have a safe uh, uh, future, but that's, <laughs> that's no longer there. $70 billion of shareholder value had became worthless, with more than 1.5 billion of that even being the retirement money of everyday Americans who didn't even work at Enron. Things were about to get even worse, and even more people would still have to lose their jobs. Although Jeffrey felt like he had lost his entire life's work, at least he was still rich, and now he had the chance to rebuild things and maybe even start a better life. Or so he thought. Little did he know, the government had started an investigation into Enron, and Jeffrey was now about to enter his final war. But this time, he would fight for his freedom. Up until now, it was still unclear to the outside world if Enron had actually done anything illegal, and no real investigations had even started. But in August of 2001, just after Jeffrey quit, Sharon Watkins, the vice president for corporate development at Enron, sent out an anonymous text directly to Ken Lay, who had taken over as CEO. Sharon wasn't a part of Jeffrey's inner circle, and she had no idea what was going on. So in that letter, she expressed some frightening concerns, saying that, I am incredibly nervous that we will implode in a wave of accounting scandals. My eight years of Enron work history will be worth nothing on my resume, and the business world will consider the past successes as nothing but an elaborate accounting hoax. Sharon was especially worried about Andrew Fasthouse Fund, which made absolutely no sense to her. And to her surprise, she managed to meet up with Ken Lay himself to talk about these issues. But he didn't take her seriously. And only two days after their meeting, Enron looked for advice on how to fire Sharon. But Sharon's letter led to rumors spreading, first within Enron and its regular employees, and then to journalists who now saw a chance to make a lot of money by exposing one of the most evil frauds in history. In October of 2001, this leads to Sharon testifying in front of Congress. And soon, the board of Enron learned that Andrew Fastow had been stealing away at least $30 million managing his own fake fund. The very same month, the SEC announces that they will launch an investigation into Enron. And now, Jeffrey realizes that he could also be in big trouble. Although he keeps telling everyone that he thought Enron was always in excellent shape. Also, you might remember the auditors of Enron, Arthur Anderson, the company who ignored and even tried to help them hide their crimes. Did you give an order to destroy documents in an attempt to subvert governmental investigations into Enron's financial collapse? And if so, did you do so at the direction or suggestion of anyone at Anderson or at Enron? Mr. Chairman, I would like to answer the committee's questions, but on the advice of my counsel, I respectfully decline to answer the question based on the protection afforded me under the Constitution of the United States. Will you invoke your Fifth Amendment rights in response to all of our questions here today? Respectfully, that will be my response to all your questions. Well, now they got convicted of obstruction of justice for helping Enron shred their documents, leading to the complete downfall of the company and ultimately more than 25,000 employees losing their jobs. And then it is finally time for Kenley, Jeffrey Skilling and Andrew Fastow to fight for their freedom in court. Although many other Enron executives also did that. But to Jeffrey's surprise, he was about to be betrayed. Kenley and Jeffrey had always claimed to be innocent. 
but not Andrew. Jeffrey had helped Andrew all the way to the top of Enron because he had a perfect personality. But this time, Jeffrey would come to regret this choice, as Andrew told the government that both him, Jeffrey, and Ken were guilty of many crimes, betraying the other executives to get a much lower sentence himself. And so, despite having made $45 million through his fake fund where he would help Enron buy things from themselves, Andrew got the shortest sentence of them all, pleading guilty to two counts of wire fraud and securities fraud and getting six years in prison, which ended up only being five years. Then, since Ken and Jeffrey claimed to be innocent, their trials were in January of 2006. And after months of intense back and forth, the jury finally found Ken Lay guilty on six counts of securities and wire fraud. But just before he could get his prison sentence, Ken died of a heart attack in July of 2006, while he was on a vacation with his wife. And so it was Jeffrey's turn, who was found guilty of conspiracy, insider trading, making false statements, and securities fraud. In total, 19 counts, with a sentence of 24 years and 4 months in prison and $45 million in fines. This was one of the longest sentences for any white collar or non violent crime. This was rough, but regardless of Jeffrey's own reasons for doing these things, there is no no question that his quest to become the king of the energy industry had led to him committing one of the worst frauds in history. Jeffrey was released in 2019 after only being in prison for 12 years. But Jeffrey's parents, who had always been there for him and who had inspired him to be successful in the first place, were no longer alive to welcome him back. Jeffrey had also tragically lost his youngest child. For a man who had once been so driven by wealth and power, hopefully Jeffrey now realized that these things were meaningless without the people he loved. He had spent so much time chasing chasing after success that he had lost sight of what was truly important. But aside from these consequences Jeffrey and his friends had to face, the Enron scandal is still affecting us all in many different ways. Firstly, it led to a lot of new regulations aimed to protect investors and the public from corporate fraud. After 2002, the penalties for fraud would get stricter and the companies were now required to report a lot more of their financial numbers. The billions of dollars lost in retirement and life savings for everyday Americans has led to a lot of people to this day struggling financially, not being able to afford their basic life needs. But craziest of all, the Enron scandal led to the permanent destruction of the reputation of the stock market and big business in general, which contributed to the brutal market crash of 2001. Because no no longer do people blindly trust the words of company executives. And we are always keeping our eyes open for the next Enron. If you watched all the way to the end, I appreciate you. Please like and subscribe and be on the lookout for the next video.